From the unexplained to the mundane, come join us on a journey to the fringe. Hello and welcome to Journey to the Fringe. We are not addicted to the fringe. We just got a hankering for some curios. We are your podcast hosts that could quit at any time, Taylor and Chelsea, here today following up on our first episode on Project Serpo, where everybody was held in suspense at this clearly true story that had been emailed anonymously to a UFO email list. So Chelsea, I don't know if you remember fully where we left off, as surprisingly this is one of those part one, part twos that we didn't film back to back. But Yeah, pretty sure we left off thinking that it was true. And clearly not Richard Doty. Definitely not Richard Doty. There is a lot of Richard Doty last week. No, no, that's not true. Just in my life last week. (laughs) Yeah, no, it was only like one (laughs) offhanded reference to him just being so smart. I can't remember exactly where we left off, though. We were learning about the planet itself. Well, yeah, there's a very long description of everything going on from their sex lives to their yelling laughs to their inability to catch things in the air. We are reading through all the posts as they're coming in. The last one that we read through came in December 2nd of 2005. These are going to continue to roll in until August of 2006, at which point there's basically just a ceasing of all emails from Anonymous. Someone got bored. Somebody got bored or somebody had something happen in their lives that meant that they don't want to do this anymore. So that'll come up later on. But where we're going to pick up this story again is in February of 2006, when a letter is written to UFO Magazine, I think at the request of its editor. And I'm just going to read this for you. You can find this right on the Serpo website. And at some point, we will actually go to the Serpo website. I was just about to do it. Then I remembered you told me. Oh, do it. Yeah. So I will wait for your prompt. And this is a great place to start off this episode. My name is Richard Doty, retired <gasps> no! special agent, Air Force Officer no! Special Investigations <laughs> AFOSI, and now a private citizen living in New Mexico. I've been an avid reader of UFO Magazine for the past several years. Recently, Bill Burns, the magazine's publisher, asked me to make some comments regarding recent Serpo revelations. I told Bill I'd be very happy to write this article relating to my personal analysis of the Serpo information, which describes an exchange program in 1965 between the U.S. military personnel and extraterrestrials from the planet Serpo and the Zeta Reticuli star system. And I do cut a portion of this out. This is just where he describes what Serpo is. So I'm going to cut that part out because that's what the entire last episode was for. We were right. This is fucking Richard Doty. Hold on. Bill Burns, right? Bill Burns, oh. B-I-R-N-E-S. Okay, he didn't come up on my episode. I thought it was... Okay, he did, no. But he didn't. Before I go into detail of Project Serpo, let me explain that I've been a recipient of Victor Martinez's email list for the past year. For those readers who don't know Victor, let me give you a brief biographical review of him. Understanding the Project Serpo disclosure starts with understanding Victor's role. Victor is a former U.S. government employee. He worked for a number of different federal law enforcement agencies and now works in L.A. as a teacher. Victor has a long-standing personal interest in the subject of UFOs and maintains an email distribution list of well over 100 recipients on the topic. In early November 2005, I learned from Victor that he'd been contacted by a person identifying himself as Anonymous, who was telling an extraordinary story. Moreover, it's one which I'd heard before. Mr. Anonymous, as I like to call him, first introduced himself as a retired employee of the U.S. government and then went on to detail the real Roswell incident. That was the core story as presented by Mr. Anonymous. In a sequence of 11 major releases of information to date, all so far via Victor Martinez, in the rest of this article, I'll offer my personal analysis of the initial contact made by Mr. Anonymous and the information released by him. In early 1979, after arriving at Kirtland Air Force Base as a young special agent with AFOSI. I don't actually know how to say that abbreviation, AFOSI. Yeah, I think it's AFOSI. AFOSI. AFOSI, okay. The, it's same thing, yeah. I was assigned to the Counterintelligence Division of AFOSI District 17. I was briefed into a special compartment program. The program dealt with the United States government involvement with extraterrestrial biological entities. During my initial briefing, I was given the complete background of our government's involvement with EBEs, extra biological entities. And this background includes information on the Roswell incident, which did indeed state that there were two crash sites that were found. The first crash site was located southeast of Corona and the second was south of Detail. 
and basically this was the exact same information that Mr. Anonymous released. Other details about the location of the bodies in the site, where the live entity was discovered, were also mentioned. I learned these details in 1979 and can confirm that Mr. Anonymous did indeed state information that was previously unknown to the public. And the fact that the bodies were taken to Los Alamos and that Sandia Base handled the second site were not known publicly in the past. This information is quite correct. During a briefing in 1984, I read a document which mentioned an exchange program between an alien race and 12 US military personnel. The briefing did not mention any specific details of the exchange program, but it did refer to the program lasting from 1965 to 1978. I tried to obtain more information during a Pentagon debriefing in 1985, but I was told I didn't have the proper clearance for that information, which I find hilarious. Like he can find out that there's an alien exchange program, but the actual details of it, no, you're not allowed to know that. Yeah, we're calling BS Like you think those story. would be on we the know. same level of top secretness. Yeah, no kidding. Plus it's Richard Doty. We know what he's up to. He has the clearance. I retired in 1988 with one exception. I never learned anything about the subject until very recently. In 1991, during a retirement party for an Afasi friend, I had a conversation with Jack Casey, Colonel, retired Air Force Intelligence. I specifically asked Colonel Casey about the exchange program I had heard about. With a look of surprise, Colonel Casey looked around as if to make sure no one was listening and then led me outside to a patio. Colonel Casey then went on to give me a short briefing about the exchange program. He told me the following. In 1965, 12 U.S. military men were placed on an extraterrestrial spacecraft and flew to an alien planet some 40 light years away. The exchange program lasted until 1978 when the team returned. Some of the 12 died on the alien planet and by 1991 when I was given this information some had died since and the final briefing of the returnees is still classified. Who'd have thunk? That's still classified. Obviously. No, all the team members are now dead, the last surviving until 2002. Again, this was exactly what Mr. Anonymous was describing. That was all of the information Colonel Casey would or could provide. I did try over the years to obtain more information, but no one, not even the retired intelligence officers I knew, had any further data they possessed or were willing to share. Then, in late 2005, 14 years later, Mr. Anonymous made the stunning release being discussed here. By the way, is it not hilarious how easy it is just for Doty to talk to somebody and then they just shift their eyes, make sure nobody's around, and they just spill everything? Like, without yeah. question, apparently. Yeah, he's Richard Doty. He just got that trustable face. He really does. Have you ever seen that face? Although much of the information correlates closely with what I've heard elsewhere, I do have a few concerns both regarding the method used by Mr. Anonymous in his initial release and also regarding some of the information itself. First, I personally have preferred Mr. Anonymous to have chosen a different medium for his release and he could perhaps have used a more open source. What does more open source mean? Like not just an email list of 100 UFO people. <laughs> I don't know, maybe WikiLeaks, something along those lines or something, I think is what he's getting at. Yeah, I mean, Richard Doty's the expert. Yeah, just telling people within the UFO community itself is probably not the best way to get Project Serpo out there if you don't want people to think it's crazy. Yeah, I have to add at this point, I mean, calling him Mr. Anonymous just really adds this more, um, like, mysterious officialness to him. Yeah, I, I actually, I was really hoping he'd go with, like, Dr. Anonymous to kind of keep <laughs> yeah, in line with yeah. how there was that blank, Dr. Blank. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to throw that random tidbit in there. Okay. Although I have nothing but praise for Victor Martinez and his email forum, I think Mr. Anonymous could have chosen a widely recognized news medium such as CNN, Fox, or the like, which would have given him more credibility and instant access to much wider public. Interesting take. If Mr. Anonymous wishes the information to be released broadly, then in my opinion, what would work best would be for him to go to such an open source and make all the information available at one time. I don't actually know the exact reasons why he chose instead to release this information via Victor Martinez. Yeah, sure you don't, Richard. Sure you don't. <laughs> Secondly, there are some apparent anomalies in the information that has been released to date. Many former intelligence officers have come forward after Mr. Anonymous made his initial release and pointed out what they claimed were errors in some of the data. For instance, Mr. Anonymous stated that 10 men and 2 women comprised the exchange team. However, both Paul McGovern, former security chief of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and Gene Laskowski, real name Gene Lakes, I don't know why that's included, <laughs> former director of security Nevada test site, 
have come forward questioning this particular gender mix of the team. Three other former Air Force intelligence officers have also questioned this information. According to Mr. McGovern, 12 men were selected, no women, and my other independent sources also confirmed that no women were sent on that mission. I'm not in any way wanting to upset female readers, but to understand how the military would have regarded this project, one would really look back to the U.S. military, not now, but way back in 1965. During that time period, women in the military were segregated. The USAF had women in the Air Force, WAFs. There were women in the Navy. They were called WAVES, which is just a hilarious acronym that's not actually like, <laughs> Navy's not in there, but it's yeah. WAVES. <laughs> and the Army had women in the Army Corps, WAX. <laughs> Most military females were in medical administrative supply or the personnel career field. Few women would have been qualified for such a long duration mission. Female astronauts were not selected until the late 1970s, and these are valid reasons to doubt Mr. Anonymous's particular statements that women were included in this particular mission. Mr. Anonymous then detailed the training given to the 12 people selected for the mission. Two former Defense Intelligence Agency employees have come forward to state that the training actually fell in line with the astronaut training and that the training lasted for one year and consisted of astronauts training rather than the intelligence and combat training detailed by Mr. Anonymous. If one stops and thinks about it, astronaut training would probably make a little more sense than the training described by Mr. Anonymous. Mr. Anonymous also mentioned some items which were taken on the mission. According to his earlier reports, the team took 9,000 pounds of equipment with them. However, Mr. Anonymous subsequently corrected this by saying 90,500 pounds of equipment were taken. So, you know, just like 10 times the amount. Yeah, easy mistake. Yeah. He then mentioned that liquid nitrogen canisters were taken as a fallback weapon against the Ebens. Which what? I didn't mention that one. There's a lot of emails, so we had to keep yeah, it brief. I would assume so. Because the Evens were sensitive to cold. But liquid nitrogen would not stay stable for an extended period of time and would last only a few weeks in a canister. Maybe Mr. Anonymous meant compressed air, which would last longer, or better yet, Freon, which would remain stable in a canister for a long period of time. Finally, Mr. Anonymous mentioned handguns and rifles being taken as defense. I have mixed feelings regarding this since it was a military team. I could understand that some weapons would be taken as a routine measure. However, if you trusted the Evens to the degree of allowing 12 United States military personnel to fly 40 light years for 12 or 13 years, why would anyone take weapons? What good would weapons do on a planet 40 light years away and if you're there for 13 years? I added that last part. If you're going with a team of 12 for 13 years, 40 light years away, that we theoretically, I guess, according to the story, have no way of actually reaching without their spacecrafts, the weapons aren't going to do anything. You'll run out of ammunition if anything happens, and there's only 12 of you so what's the point okay then i think it makes sense does it to not take weapons yeah that's actually a really good point okay i can also see you know the military industrial complex really likes weapons so they wanted to sell just like 20 more handguns hmm. or something exactly and plus it's good advertising on the positive side of mr anonymous's information a number of insiders and researchers have reported hearing of such an exchange program here these include such respected individuals as <gasps> Cool. Linda Howe and Whitley Strieber. Uh, okay, only one of those is good. Together with Colonel Casey and all the former DIA officials mentioned above, Whitley Strieber's tantalizing and brief experience over 10 years ago was with a man he met at a convention who claimed to have been on the Serpo team before he left Strieber to consider what he had been told. Can you imagine meeting Whitley Strieber and being like, by the way, I've been to Serpo. <laughs> Just wanted you to know. Handguns. <laughs> That's actually going to come up later on here. Okay. Wait until the end of this, because I have a story about this. This overall degree of corroboration seems highly significant, as I think readers will agree. Some of the data provided by Mr. Anonymous seems off-beam. The orbital data and other scientific information, although he did state intriguingly that the laws of physics were not exactly the same on Serpo as they were in our own solar system. Nevertheless, there's growing debate regarding the scientific information provided by Mr. Anonymous about the planet Serpo and that solar system. According to him, Serpo was a planet of a binary star system. Binary star system is a double star, each orbiting their common center of mass. I'm not a math or science expert and will not state all the different figures or formulas, but it seems to me that there are legitimate arguments on both sides of this issue. But I have to say that I do feel that a simple hoaxer would have been sure to get the numbers right. Yeah. The purpose of a hoaxer or even someone spreading disinformation is after all to convince not to lay himself open to criticism straight away, says the guy who says he's not good at math or science. That is hilarious. Like, yeah. he's telling the truth his numbers are all off yeah. <laughs> he checks out i'm richard doty <laughs> To conclude, and aside from the broadly confirming testimony of my various colleagues, Mr. Anonymous is simply, in my opinion, not operating like a hoaxer would. A hoaxer would have actually done a better job, so to speak. <laughs> a 
<laughs> researching information for his hoax. Importantly, the apparent anomalies and absences of the promised photographs to date can all be accounted for if we suppose that the context under which Mr. Anonymous is operating is not exactly as it may first appear. We must remember that Mr. Anonymous will hardly have the 3,000 page report in his living room, just sitting there like a Sears catalog. The report will be guarded under the tightest conceivable security, and the conditions of access are unknown by us. We can hypothesize that Mr. Anonymous may not even have access to the documents at all, and may be relying on memory, someone else's memory, or someone else supplying him with the information, maybe by phone or by tape, under conditions over which he himself has no control. As for the photographs, which he said there's tons of photographs, but they're all in a vault somewhere, they may again be in a different location. Paradoxically, there is the factor of Mr. Anonymous having gone quiet since his last post on December 21st, up to the time of my writing this on January 13th, 2006. This may be precisely because he has been indeed met with difficulty caused by insider agents. We know that there are different factions within the intelligence community regarding disclosure. Some may wish to obstruct a disclosure such as this, while some others may be looking the other way, quietly supporting the disclosure by allowing it to happen. We just don't know at this point. These factors are not reasons in themselves to accept the story. However, they are persuasive reasons not to dismiss it without very careful thought indeed. In conclusion, it seems to me that while there are some discrepancies in details, there's a persuasively broad measure of an agreement that such a project actually existed and there are good reasons for us to suspend our disbelief. I earnestly hope that by the time this edition of the magazine is published, we have heard more from Mr. Anonymous and that this important revelation will continue well into 2006. So, clearly dissuaded you from thinking it's Mr. Doty, correct? Uh, obviously, yeah. I'm... They have different 100%. information. Yeah. yeah. And he just said all the reasons why it could be a hoaxer or it couldn't. So he's the expert on that, not Serpo. That's for yeah. sure. And by the way, there's two names that showed up in there that we'll probably at some point do episodes on. Not Colonel Casey. We might do an episode on Colonel Casey at some point. I don't know. I haven't looked into him yet. But Whitley Strieber and yeah. Linda Moulton Howe. Linda Moulton Howe comes up again at the end of the episode. Whitley Strieber, though, went on Coast to Coast in 2005 with Richard Doty and Bill oh, Ryan. For Sakes. And you know how he mentioned that somebody came up to Whitley Strieber and was talking about Serpo? This is the paragraph in the Coast to Coast episode in 2005. Strieber shared an incident that took place at a UFO conference in Gulf Breeze, Florida in the early 90s when an elderly gentleman told him he could prove he was from another planet, saying only one word after that. Do you want to guess what it was? Dodie. Uh, what else could it be? You're never going to guess it. Was it like that high-pitched laughing sound? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it is Serpico. Serpico. Okay, I would have never guessed that. <laughs> he now wonders if he misheard the word and the man was actually saying Serpico. <laughs> Dodie said he was first skeptical of Project Serpo info, but later heard rumors within the intelligence community that the story is in fact true. I just love that. What are we even talking about? Are we sure it's Serpo? Okay. Serpico. Seriously. That's his connection. He might not have even been talking about Serpo. Nope. <laughs> Oh, okay. So there's supposed to be hundreds, if not thousands of photos that were taken from Project Serpo. They're all apparently still behind a vaulted door that nobody can get into. Very private, very classified. Yeah, like a paywall. But Bill Ryan did provide this one photo. Chelsea, I'm just going to share my screen right. so you can see it. And I'm going to give you the background behind this story. Because he wrote this. This is right on the Serpo webpage. I've seen this before. Yeah. Hi, Bill Ryan received this from an ex-intelligence officer while at the UFO Congress in Laughlin, Nevada in March 2006. It is not specifically connected with Serpo, and the source was not anonymous. However, such is the nature of the material that it is assumed that the visitors to this site will be most interested in this image. I was informed that it was a real photograph, but it has not been analyzed. I have had confirmation from two sources, one who has seen a film of an EB-1 made as a briefing for President Truman, and another who worked for six months as a military archive in the original Roswell crash material, that even if this is a model or a mock-up of some kind, is an excellent likeness. I present this image for the visitor's interest without further comment. Okay, that was a lot of comment for no further comment. <laughs> what do you think? Definitely not real. Yeah, and it's been confirmed that this is clearly a fake photo since then. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy to tell that that is not real. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's... Yeah. 
<laughs> that happened March of 2006. August of 2006 is the last release from Anonymous. And then yeah. Bill Ryan, who is hosting Serpo.org, hosts this on March 5th, 2007. And it is entitled Serpo is Dead. Long live Serpo. What? And that's, I guess, the title or an exchange program almost certainly happened and why I'm now moving on to other things. So this is his goodbye letter from Serpo. <laughs> okay. And it's pretty big, so let's just get ready for this. <laughs> With no further Serpo information having been released since August 2006, readers can be forgiven for assuming that despite several more false dawns, there may now be no more. This is an assumption now shared by myself. In December 2006, after Victor Martinez had received a number of photos which turned out to be fakes, I first drafted this update page you're now reading. My intention was to hand this site over to another webmaster and focus my intentions full time, rather than just 95% of the time, on Project Camelot. We'll do a whole episode on Project Camelot in the future. They're, yeah, putting it on like, the list. It's, yeah, no comment at this point. <laughs> but you now see who's associated with it, which supports disclosures and which publishes interviews free of charge with insiders and other important witnesses to government secrecy. I withheld posting it then because there was reason to hold the possibility that at least some of the insiders who were part of the backstage story might be present at the 2007 Laughlin UFO Congress. However, this has just been concluded and no one was there, with one exception. There was an elderly man with aquiline features and wearing a pilot's jacket, who, to my great interest, was clearly shocked to see me there again. I don't understand that reference. Do we find out who he is? We'll keep going, don't worry. I met him at last year's Congress and have been told that he was Paul McGovern, a retired DIA official well-known in insider UFO circles, and, you know, one of Doty's insiders. Uh. He was attending under a pseudonym. Last year, this man had indeed shown an uncommon interest in me, and after the Congress was over, I'd been told he had passed on the message to me via an intermediary to ask whether or not I had, quote, bought the story, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> this year, on seeing him again, I confronted him, but he earned his paycheck by denying complicity to the bitter end. Which, you know, he didn't actually say this to him about bought the story. Somebody said that he related to him. Uh, he didn't say it specifically to him. So him denying the story kind of just says that the other guy's lying. I really like that he's like, are you buying it? <laughs> but he didn't say it. Somebody said that he said it to him. Eventually, I left him alone, seeing that no further progress would be made, seeing as how he said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Having analyzed all the available photographs, I don't believe he was Paul McGovern, but I do believe he's a DIA agent. <laughs> <laughs> that should be no surprise as agents frequently patrol UFO conventions. But this too merely adds to the smoke and mirrors of the ongoing Serpo intrigue. As ever, nothing definitive transpired. <laughs> Meanwhile, in hitting strongly at a great deal more substance, I had told the story in our 17th of February 2006 Coast to Coast AM radio interview of how Carrie Cassidy and I had made contact with an elderly man who we'd been told, again, secondhand information. I'm going to start that again just so we can make sure that we hear this. I told the story in our 17th of February, Coast to Coast AM interview of how Carrie Cassidy and I had made contact with an elderly man who we'd been told off the record was a reserve Serpo astronaut who had trained with the team who went on the mission. Mm -hmm. The full story follows here and makes for fascinating readings. In brackets, readers may be interested to know that the identity of the senior CIA agent was who contacted us in irritation. Unnamed below can be deduced from reading Dan Smith's blog and some care and attention. The agent is identified as SI, an acronym for Salmo Iridius, or Troutfish, end bracket. Okay. While intending no harm or discourtesy, and definitely with no intention to betray confidentiality, we had evidently trodden on the toes of both the DIA and CIA, as no one had imagined that we would be actually able to take it upon ourselves to contact the person, now known in Serpa lore as, quote, the old man, end quote. What a nice thing to be known. This is what happened. Yeah, so they're, they're gonna start trying to contact this man that somebody told them was part of Serpo. This guy hasn't said it, and this is the story. Could you imagine someone just, like, doxing you like that? <laughs> And it's Doty for sure. It told them that. He's like, it's that guy. He went to Serpo. Go ask him. I was told the name of someone who was supposedly a Serpo reserve astronaut as far back as February of 2006. This occurred naturally in a conversation with members of the intelligence community. And I was also told the general area where this person lived. A couple months later, on April 21st, Carrie Cassidy and I opted to take a little initiative of our own. We did a search on the internet and found his name. Together with the street address and phone number, so we decided to write him. The letter was sent by FedEx. 
Genetics. It expressed support, promised that his ID and contact details would not be revealed to anyone, and said that we'd be delighted to assist with the disclosure effort with a Project Camelot interview under any stipulated conditions of confidentiality and sought to establish direct communication if at all possible. The letter was delivered and signed for, but after that there was silence. He never responded. We came to suspect that we'd written to the wrong person. It was all a mistake. <laughs> Probably a good assumption at that point. Yep, okay, so what do they do now? <laughs> then, out of the blue on September 8th, I receive an email from dot 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 dot, not Mark Private, saying, did you go to dot 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 to see Mr. dot 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 with your girlfriend and a camera? Where did you get this man's name and address? That was the email he received. That's a confusing email. I'm assuming names are in there. He's just redacting it. Oh, okay. We thought, quote, thank you, dot, 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 end quote. Beautiful confirmation. That was a slip on this person's part. The distortion in Anonymous's belief, I can't say Anonymous because Anonymous is the person who writes this. The distortion in this writer's belief about what happened and the time delay four and a half months made us wonder if this had been reported up the line through the DIA across the CIA at a high level and then down to this guy. Accumulating errors along the way. We'll leave others to determine the likelihood of this person still being on the CIA payroll. So just so you know, they did not go to this house with a camera. So that's what he's saying, and it's weird. Yeah, the email's weird, right? Yeah. Okay, not just me then. And probably Doty. Let's just throw it out there. It's probably Doty. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I did not reply to this guy's email question, and he did on 6th of October, in the context of an email to me about other matters and CC to Victor Martinez, Robert Collins, Marilyn Rubin, Brendan Burton, and Larry Dickens, he wrote, I accept you're not answering me about your intrusion with camera and recording device to try and interview the old man as a private matter. Thanks, this person. So now we know he's an old man. We had, of course, never met him. <laughs> Jeez. In December, meeting with Victor for the first time in a while, Victor told us that he too had heard that we had greatly irritated the DIA with our little initiative, and importantly, that this was the reason that I was suddenly cut out of the loop soon after the delivery of the FedEx letter regarding receiving any of the Serpo releases directly. Students of the ongoing saga will recall that it was then that the releases reverted to Victor. Just so we're on the same page, literally all he did was send a letter to a random house that was yeah. apparently signed for, which if a letter was addressed to me, I would sign for. Yep. That's not accepting that it is correct. No, and it sounds like he's doing that. And they're kind of like, I don't even know how to put this. They're like, because we didn't hear anything back, that means that we were right because it went up so high into the DIA and the CIA came back down and I was cut out. It came back that I was completely doing something that I was not. So yeah. their info <laughs> is just completely off and they're not even willing to do the research into what this guy's done. Oh my god. God. And they're like, and that's why we're right. Yeah. Like, we're on to something. Straight up, it sounds like something Richard Doty did. It does. 100%. <laughs> Without knowing much. <laughs> Meanwhile, in November, Carrie and I decided to visit the man in person. We prepared a letter of the utmost oh, courtesy no. to be hand-delivered, and we would then retire to a coffee shop for several hours with our cell phone on the table. Then we would head back home again after a pre-allotted time. Our letter read, This is the letter. Dear Mr. Blank, we were given your name by Blank and found your address in the Blank phone book. In May of this year, we delivered a secure personal letter to you by FedEx. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk with you in person under any conditions of confidentiality which you may stipulate. We'd like to assess how we may be able to help your efforts to release the Serpo story. And we're aware that the ongoing release has met with numerous difficulties over the course of the year. And we'd like to emphasize that we do not wish to do anything to breach your requested confidentiality. We've known your identity and contact details for many months, yet have never revealed these to anyone else. And we assure you that we can be trusted fully. Oh. We'll be in blank for the rest of the afternoon until 7 p.m. Please call us at blank cell. And if you or any other of your colleagues are interested in meeting with us, we'd be delighted to hear from you. We delivered the letter. Most interestingly, the man's wife was waiting for us at the gate as we arrived. Despite our having informed no one of our plan, we'd either been tracked or our car is bugged. Or she was just out by her gate on her property in the mail or something. Neither would be surprised. The man himself who was elderly but looked as he'd been strong and athletic in his youth, was at the door watching, some 20 or 30 yards away. We were polite and deferential, handed her the letter and immediately left. We waited till 7pm but the phone did not ring. <laughs> 
how did he get that idea of the story? Chelsea, if you were to describe that, would you say, there was someone outside, I handed the letter and left? Yes. Like, is that not the easiest way to say that? Instead of, our car was bugged and she was waiting for us. Well, there's a reason they do what they do. I think they're trying to sell a story is what they're trying to do. And I can't say that it's not a nice way to say that. I find it a lot better than saying we showed up, she just happened to be outside and we left. That was a lot more entertaining for sure to say it that way. I'm happy he did it this way. It gives us something to talk about. It does. <laughs> and I'm finding this quite hilarious. Now, my question to you, I'm just going to interrupt for a second. If this is happening to you, do you call the number? No. God. No. You don't? No, these guys seem fucking insane. I feel like I might. I feel like they want to be fucked with. So what are they trying to do here? They're just trying to corroborate the story? So they were told this guy would have been a Serpo astronaut. He was an alternative. He didn't actually go. So they want him to disclose his story on record. Okay. I mean, I feel like I'd... Like, who told them this? Probably Richard Doty. And they're just yeah. bugging some guy who has not confirmed that he was an astronaut in Serpo. They don't even know what this guy did. Like, literally nothing about this guy. This guy probably cut Richard Doty off in traffic one day. And he looked up... By the way, purely speculation that it's Richard Doty. Whenever we say Richard Doty throughout most of this, it's just us speculating. Yeah, he's a dick. I feel like I'd call. Okay. I feel like I'd call and if it says serpo i don't know either i call and i'd be like i don't know what the fuck you guys are talking about like leave me alone it's serpico you fools <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or I run with it and I go with it because they're clearly desperate for something and you fuck with them more. Because someone's clearly fucking with them in the first place. By the way, they got a great disclaimer paragraph right after this entirely, like, highly, highly speculative story they just told. None of this proves that the man was an astronaut or that Serpo exists, but it does show fairly conclusively that we'd stepped heavily on someone's toes by making contact with this man. I would say. And that the report had rippled out through the Intel community to eventually reach <laughs> the person who emailed us. That's that's exactly what we just said. <laughs> so, an old man sensitively connected to the story definitely exists and is being well protected. Definitely, by that woman at the gate. <laughs> she was going to kick their ass. She was definitely standing By the way, there. old people love to stand in their window and see what's going on with the outside world. Oh, they love it. Especially if it's their wife talking to somebody, like, without a doubt. Well, not only that, but if the wife is probably there checking out what's going on in yeah. the neighborhood, too. Yeah. She just needed a better angle on the neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. In another synchronous event, Shauna Connolly, having oh, come to blows in protest at their unethical activity, I have no idea what that means, with Ryan Dubé and Stephen <laughs> Broadbent, her former conspirators and debunkers at the Re Reality Uncovered Forum, outed Reality Uncovered ongoing smear campaign in massive and compelling detail on Serpo.info, which I didn't even realize until just now. It's not Serpo.org, it's Serpo.info. I don't know if that's a separate website. The only thing she omitted to mention is the listed catalog of dirty tricks was their having gained unauthorized access to my personal email account, not just the Serpo emails, last November and December. An action which I've obtained legal advice was criminal. Apart from this detail, the entire account of the smear campaign is well told on serpo.info and needs no repetition on these pages. All this combined with Carrie, Cassie, and myself celebrating the first anniversary of our initial meeting when Carrie interviewed me with another interview 12 months on to the day made me realize that now was the optimum time to step down for being the webmaster of this site, which has intrigued and involved so many for so long. As stated above, I've been considering this since December 2006, and the principal trigger for the final decision now was the Laughlin anniversary combined with the complete lack of further updates for six months. Mm. So from here on out, I'll look back on Serpo with a mixture of fondness and relief. I'll be focusing full time on Project Camelot, a website of comprehensive video interviews with insiders and other important disclosure witnesses. Here are my conclusions such as it's possible to reach any. One, as I stated in my July 26th American Anti-Gravity interview, I believe the Serpo story is a mixture of disinformation and naturally occurring compounded errors surrounding a core of extraordinary truths. Well, that was a sad end. As stated above, an old old man sensitively connected to the story definitely exists <laughs> and is being well protected <laughs> by the woman at the gate yeah. 
<laughs> My instinct that this story has been made available to the general public has turned out to be well justified. There's been an extraordinary amount of dirty tricks and smears specifically intended to discredit the story, but emanating from relatively small groups of people. The phrase exchange program has now permanently introduced itself into the vocabulary of the UFO community, and an exchange program of some kind definitely occurred. The Serpo account is endlessly fascinating and is, is bound to remain controversial. However, it was an event that occurred about 50 years ago and is primarily historical. While one can always learn from the study of history or of historical events, my attention is now concentrated on information and research concerning what may lie ahead for us all. For those readers who like to involve themselves in ongoing discussions and debate, we'll have them here, and as stated above, my own focus will now be 100% on Project Camelot. My best wishes to those who have shown interest in the fascinating story. And as of the last update, in the contact information, it says in April of 2007, Bill Ryan transferred ownership of the website to the administration of the Outpost Forum. We maintain good working relations with both Bill Ryan and Victor Martinez and will continue to update the site as necessary. Readers who have questions or would like further information will find a wealth of discussion threads on the Project Serpo board and we'd like you to join us for debate. And Chelsea, now you can go to serpo.org and Yay! tell me what you see. The site has been suspended. S-E-R-P-O dot org. Yeah, read what it says. Okay, this is the right spot. The reason for this could be for instance an unpaid invoice. <laughs> Please check your emails from us and your invoices in your control panel. If you need more help, don't hesitate to contact our support. Best regards, Servage. So that means that they had no way of contacting the group that actually owned it. So the only way for them to tell them, hey, you're not paying your bills is to literally just put it when they try Updated to access on the, the website. Site. And obviously nobody has cared. Yeah, but yeah. it's not actually that long ago. It's about January of 2023. This all came from the way back really? and everything I was saying. Yeah, so they maintained it for a long time. That's not that long ago. And all of a no. sudden they're like, fuck it. Okay. So that is the reign of the Serpo story. That was a real letdown. Hold on. Let me highlight everything on this page. Nope, that's it. No sex stuff, unfortunately. Nope. <laughs> Unless you go to the way back machine, in which case there is sex stuff. Oh, okay. With the Serpos. Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> and screaming. I did want to highlight that Richard Doty said that yes. it is corroborated by both Linda Moulton Howe and Whitley Strieber. I would really like to point out Whitley Strieber and Linda Moulton Howe on alien exchange programs get all their information from Richard Doty. What? No. Yeah. No, not can. Yeah. Not still. Linda Moulton Howe still. You're going to be real sad once I finish this part, Chelsea. No. Author and filmmaker Linda Moulton Howe were first told about an Earth Alien Exchange program in 1983 when doing research for UFOs, The E.T. Factor, a documentary for HBO. At the time, she was approached by Air Force Sergeant Richard C. Doty, who said that he had been given approval to allow her to air secret Air Force information and video footage in her documentary. Doty promised to supply Howe with material that would confirm the existence of extraterrestrial races, including official government and military documents, film, and photographs. However, he continued to string Howe along until he finally told her that his superiors had decided against releasing any information. Without Doty's evidence, HBO gave up on the documentary in 1984, and since that time, Doty's name has surfaced in many other things. You can go listen to our Doty episode. He comes up a lot, though. That's so much he comes up. Didn't expect it. There has been talks of the eventual release of photographs taken on Serpo by the exchange team, but so far, nothing has emerged to lend credence to this baffling story, and until the time they actually come out with physical evidence about Project Serpo, the story should be treated as another unverifiable UFO tale all of it a fun one. I quite enjoy Serpo as a story. Chelsea, this really bothered me. What is it? When would you think's a reasonable time to have your last interview with Richard Doty without being not credible anymore? Like the 80s. As soon as she found out that he was giving her false information, which was the 80s. Earth Files, Linda Moulton House podcast. I don't want 2017, to they aired an no. interview with him. No! Why? Yes. Linda, why? I need answers. Do you know why? No idea. I was starting to listen to it, but I just ran out of time and it didn't have to do specifically with Serpo. It was yeah. actually about Rendlesham. So uh -huh. like that's, yeah, that bothers me a lot. Sorry, Rendlesham, Richard Doty and Rendlesham? Yeah. No. Yeah, all the documents that he saw confirming Yeah. Uh. 
My heart is breaking. Oh no. So we have two things to talk about right now. We're going to go over the Rational Wiki and then we're going to talk about Coast to Coast and we'll be done with this episode. So surprisingly, Rational Wiki comes to a lot of the same conclusion as us. Anonymous claimed to be a retired U.S. government official with top secret clearance. Mr. Anonymous, you mean? Of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> Investigation by the Reality Uncovered Network led them to believe that this Mr. Anonymous was Richard Doty, a former okay. security guard <laughs> with the Air Force with a Fosse. The RUN investigators developed the story to include two other fabricators, the three being known alternatively as the Imaginary Intelligence Agency or Scammers Inc. I should just say that I agree with that fully. They did put a citation in there for this. The citation leads to a Chinese website. I don't like how they've cited it. I want to believe that this thing exists. I can't guarantee that this actually exists. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about the physics of the story. Okay. So assuming figures are correct, traveling at 40 times the speed of light for four, 10 months would mean that Serpo would only be 33.3 light years away, not 39 light years as described. Alternatively, if it is in fact 39 light years away, then the trip must have taken 11.7 months at 40 times the speed of light. So their math doesn't check out on how long it took to get there. Next mm -hmm. up, believers in Serpo cite the use of wormholes to explain time travel. These are still just science fiction. Like we don't really, we've never seen one. We don't know if they actually exist. They're just theoretical and used in science fiction for travel purposes. Okay. Can I also just add the math being off just proves that it's true. Oh, right. As Dodi said. Yeah. And not yeah. the fact that Dodi was bad at math. So his math yeah. wouldn't track. So he would say that that. Exactly. I mean, it's true. <laughs> yeah. The reticuli binary star are many thousands of astronomical units apart. And a planetary orbit is problematic because any classic orbit around just one of the stars would be so eccentric that temperature variations over the planet's years would be so extreme as to make multicellular life very difficult or impossible. And the claim that radiation at surface surface is intense is also hard to believe. <laughs> These stars are also relatively young, perhaps only half as old as our sun. While that fact does not rule out the evolution of a technically advanced civilization, it certainly reduces the probability. That one I don't agree with because the Serpo peoples, the Ebens, specifically said that they traveled there later on. Yeah, come on. Yeah, they also say that antimatter as an energy source, not ridiculous per se, but we don't know how it would actually work. And it's very likely to explode basically from how we understand antimatter and not be a very usable source. Okay. So Serpo, the people involved are absolutely crazy. Like every single one of them, from Doty to Bill Ryan. They come up with the craziest explanations for these. But the mantle's been taken up from the Coast to Coast perspective by a man by the name of Len Caston. Len, here's his biography on Coast to Coast. Len has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University, where he majored in psychology and minored in literature and philosophy. Obviously the guy that you want involved in UFO leaks. Yeah. He entered the U.S. Air Force Aviation Cadet Program. After graduating while well in the Air Force, he experienced a UFO encounter that had a transformative experience in his life, although he didn't realize it until a few years later. There's more to it, but I really want to focus on what he actually talks about. He talks about like three main categories, and he's not involved with the original thing. This is just him looking at it as observer. He's written many books on it though at this point. First thing he talks about, Serpo. Next thing he talks about, Nazis in Antarctica. Third thing he talks about, reptilians. And those are his go-to stuff on Coast to Coast AM. Those are some three good picks. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna go through his list of stuff he talks about. He was on in 2020. Nazi reptilian space program. He was on in 2019. Serpo, reptilians, and Nazis. Nazi reptilian space program to Serpo. <laughs> He was on in 2017, <laughs> Reptilian Conquest. He was on in 2016, ET Exchange Program. He was on in 2014, Project Serpo. 2013, Project Serpo. 2010, The ET Agenda. So just like, the guy is interesting to say the least. He also has added a bit to the story, saying that this is from one of his episodes, I can't remember which one. The Ebens used a deceased exchange member to create a new hybrid creature and had done similar experimentations with beings that they had brought back from many other worlds. Oh, he has revealed. Most of the exchange team returned to Earth in 1978. The highly classified Project Gleam was developed to foster communications between Serpo and Earth and involves a beam that's propelled at enormous speeds, he explained. According to Kasten, the Ebens continue to have diplomatic relationships with our civilization. And the last time Coast to Coast AM had somebody on about Project Serpo, 2023. Really? 
Yeah. I mean, there's only so many people out there that you can talk to. So, I mean, I would listen to it if I still had it. No, because this story is just freaking ridiculous. I love this story. I know. It's so good. It's nice and to And the people imagine. involved are insane. So, yeah, that's where yeah. I'm going to leave you guys off with Serpo. It's fucking insane. All the people involved with it are insane. Or also talk about reptilians and Nazis. Sometimes all of those three things in the same episode. Our span. And I yeah. love that. I do have something to add or just like speculate on. Okay. This is if this is Richard Doty, which it is, I love that that's the same conclusion that they drew as well. Because, yeah. like, right away on the first episode, we were like, it's Richard Doty. Because as soon as you hear this, him giving praise to Richard Doty, it's Richard Doty. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, if it is Richard Doty, the guy has such a big fucking ego, which he does. I think we gathered as much when we did the episode on him. Because, first of all, he's like, they'll give it to this fantastic person to leak to named. Richard Doty and then he like goes on to give a statement to the UFO magazine he's like this is obviously all true because of this but it might be a hoaxer because of this and like what a big ego the guy has to like do something like that and that's how you know it's Richard Doty yeah <laughs> and then Bill Ryan is clearly <laughs> just getting emails from Richard Doty and him on to investigate this thing with this yeah. random old man clearly yeah. speculation on my part that it's clearly Richard Doty that sent those emails and by this point when was this this is the 80s right the, that um him go Serpo. sending the letters so yeah. no serpo happened between the 60s and uh the 70s it was a 13 year period oh so this is before hold on this is before we all knew about what he was up to Hold on. No, but the stories that we're talking about, like them interacting through the website, is all 2005 to 2007. Oh. So this is yeah. all when everybody knows what Richard Doty's up to. Well, it, it's still a fresher story. There might be still people that believe that his side. At this point, right. you have no reason to believe Richard who the Doty. F who would re believe Richard Doty? Bill Ryan. <laughs> Bill Ryan. <laughs> You're not and he really wants the story to be true and is taking unverifiable secondhand information as gospel and saying because they didn't respond to my letter is proof that they were oh involved. he's trying it's to like, make it happen yeah for yeah. sure so yeah that's the story chelsea anything else you want to add that's it i love the serpo story i'm never gonna stop loving the serpo story i didn't know any of the side of the serpo story and I loved it. And you started off this episode with a shocker. And I love and that as well. I honestly find the background of everything people are saying outside of the Serpo story itself is just as insane as the Serpo story. And I love it. That just adds so much more to it. Nobody talks about it. They're not going to talk about that on Coast to Coast AM. No. But yeah, that was great. Experts on that side disregard this information as inconvenient. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. I loved it. I loved all of it. That was Perfect. great. And I hope you all did at home as well. I have been Taylor here with Chelsea. We are Journey to the Fringe. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you next week. Hey. Thank you for listening to Journey to the Fringe. If you have liked what you have listened to, please like, share, subscribe, or follow, depending on what venue you are listening to us through. Also, please, if possible, leave a five-star review as that really helps us in the algorithms. Should you wish to interact with us, please check us out on your social media of choice. I bet you we are there. And if you really want to communicate with us and give us ideas for new episodes or tell us that we're wrong and terrible, either way, please send us an email at journeytothefringe at gmail.com. For now, I'll see you in the next episode. Uh.